Our speaker will be Dr. Dorothy Chiyunye, who is the director of the Ugandan National Blood Transfusion Service in Kampala, Uganda. She will be speaking on donor mobilization and blood collection. Good morning, everybody. First of all, on behalf of Uganda Blood Transfusion Services, I'd like to welcome you to Uganda and to thank the organizers who have given us this opportunity to hold this educational conference here. Dr. Ziki has talked about education, he has talked about research, he has talked about working together, and I hope at the end of this conference we shall have achieved all these objectives. So I'm going to talk about one of the most important topics, that is donor mobilization and blood collection. And this forms the basis of blood transfusion therapy in Sub-Saharan Africa. We all know that when there is no donor, then there's no blood. And when there's no blood in the hospitals, then patients are likely to die. You've seen, we need blood. We need blood all the time to be able to manage our patients. So now, let's maybe take a look at what blood transfusion services in Sub-Saharan Africa is. We know that blood and blood products have become indispensable in the care of sickle cell patients, in the care of pediatric patients, trauma, obstetric and cancer patients in Sub-Saharan Africa. And now we know that even Ebola, Dr. Ziki has alluded to that, we need blood. If we don't get plasma from this blood, then there's no way we can treat these Ebola patients. And also, Ebola has also had an impact on our blood collection programs because areas that may be infected, may be infested with Ebola, may be no-go areas for our blood collection teams. So it is part of this, this treatment that we really need to make sure that we treat those patients, the pediatric patients, I've seen the program, this blood transfusion in pediatrics, blood transfusion in trauma, in obstetric and cancer patients. So we need blood, but as you know, you know that blood transfusion services in, is a vital but very often neglected part of the national health service in Sub-Saharan Africa. There are very few countries in Sub-Saharan Africa who have a fully fledged blood transfusion service in their countries. Many countries do have a serious lack of expertise and facilities to operate a blood transfusion unit. And you find that in Sub-Saharan Africa, I think Uganda is next to South Africa in having a, an infrastructure in place for a blood transfusion, blood transfusion service. And serious economic constraints limit their ability to cope with national needs for blood and blood products and often relegate this activity to donor-funded projects. Uganda is an example of, of countries that are struggling to make sure that we maintain a blood transfusion service in our country. Our program is partly donor-funded and I think we are not different from other sub-Saharan countries because many governments cannot afford to fully fund blood transfusion services in their countries. And you find that like in Uganda, we are donor funded and even other countries cannot do without a donor to help them in their blood transfusion services. And blood transfusion services is a costly venture. Because like in Uganda here, it costs about $40 to process one unit of blood. So you can imagine, this is more expensive than antiretroviral therapy, and even more expensive than the most expensive antibiotics. So you can imagine, if we don't have this blood, if we are not donor funded, then we shall not be able to meet our hospital blood demands. So what do we, what, 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 how can we talk about blood donation? 
we can't talk about blood donation unless we talk about voluntary non-humated blood donation. The donation of blood by voluntary donors is crucial for the safety and sustainability of national blood supplies. You know that much as blood can save life, it can also transmit disease. It can transmit HIV, it can transmit hepatitis B, it can transmit hepatitis C, it can also transmit CVC, and even then now, I think it can even transmit Ebola if the patient is in the incubation period. So we need to make sure that we get these voluntary donors to give us blood because we know they are maybe at a lower risk of these transmissible infections. The recruitment of regular voluntary animated blood donors is the foundation of a safe and adequate blood supply. Remember, we have to emphasize the word regular because we cannot depend on one-time donations. We need to depend on regular blood donors who will give us blood on a regular basis because we need blood every time, we need blood every hour, and we need blood every minute. And these regular blood donors are safer because they have been tested more than at least three times. And the HIV virus and other TTIs focuses on attention on the need for safe blood and blood products. We know that in sub-Saharan Africa, the HIV rate is quite high. There are those countries that have rates that go as high as 10% among the donor population. And you must remember that it is still this donor population where we are going to collect our blood. So what do we do? We are looking at the safety as well as looking at the adequacy, which both must balance. When you look critically look at the safety, then you may compromise the adequacy. And when you look at the adequacy, then you are likely to compromise on the safety. So what do we do? This is the dilemma we are facing. And it is not a, a very easy job. It's a very difficult job because we set targets which we have meet, to meet. But much as we set these targets and want to meet these targets, we want to make sure that we collect blood, process this blood, issue this blood in the most cost-effective and efficient manner. So my staff are always on the move. They have to make sure they achieve these goals, but they must make sure that we achieve these goals in a safety and in an adequacy manner. It is estimated that the transfusion of HIV through blood transfusion is more than 90% efficient. So you can imagine much as the other ven uh, venues of transmission are controlled, like the sexual transmission, like maybe mother to child PMTC programs, there is still this trans transmission through blood. And you know that blood is always most times given an emergency. And you don't choose to get a blood transfusion, but you can choose to have a sexual partner. So if that partner infects you, then you are not going to blame anybody. But if you get a, a blood transfusion which is infected, then you may blame somebody. And you may, it is not good for the blood safety program because we don't want to transmit infections through the transfusion. Thus, preventing the spread of HIV and other TTIs through blood and blood products is a goal that should be attained by every national blood program. There are many countries in Sub-Saharan Africa who do not even test blood, who give blood without testing this blood for HIV or for other TTIs. So you can imagine what happens. That means the rate of transmission of HIV and other TTIs through blood is quite high in those countries which do not test for these infections. So let's talk about other types of donors. We know that the safest donor is the voluntary, regular, non-humated blood donor. But then these other countries in sub-Saharan Africa who don't have a fully fledged blood transfusion system tend to have what we call family or replacement blood donors. In sub-Saharan Africa, there are countries that have systems based 
on replacement donation by the family and friends of patients requiring transfusion, and those countries are not able to meet clinical demands for blood. So you can imagine, if you have a road traffic accident victim, who, who gets knocked down by a border border, who gets knocked down by a car, and ends up in hospital and needs blood. So if the relative is not close by, what is going to happen? That patient will not get access to blood because there will be no family or replacement donor to give him this blood. And you know, even then, this replacement blood donation, you need to test this blood, you need to screen it, you need to quarantine it. So that means that if you have this kind of system, it will not work. It will not work in our sub-Saharan African countries, but the, the challenge is that most of these countries do have these systems in place. There are very few countries in sub-Saharan Africa that have a regular voluntary blood donation system. This is a very big challenge for sub-Saharan Africa. Then we have those paid or what we call commercial donors. These paid commercial donors are found in countries that have the paid donation system which poses serious threats to the health and safety of the recipients as well as the donors themselves due to TTIs. You know, some people may want money. So you can sell your blood, like Dr. Zika has shown us that blood is being sold on the black market because they want to, this blood to treat Ebola. Even then, there are those people who, are, who, who tend to wait outside the hospitals who can sell their blood in order to earn a living. But you can imagine these people may be transmitting infections, may not be safe to donate blood, may donate blood every day. So you can imagine their blood may not be beneficial to the patient. Then what about those patients who may not have the money to pay for this blood? What will they do? That means we shall not be able to meet the goal of sufficiency and safety. Therefore, building a stable base of the safest possible blood donors is important to ensure the safety, sufficiency, and sustainability of a national blood supply. The national blood supply is based on the safety. We have to make sure that we collect safe blood. It's also based on sufficiency. We have to make sure that much as this blood is safe, it has to be sufficient. That's why I said it's very difficult to, to balance the safety and the adequacy. At any one time, one may be compromised. And then we have the issue of sustainability of a national blood supply. I told you that most of our blood supply systems are based on donor funding. Then what happens if the donor funds run out? What, would, what will you do? So these three key areas should be handled by each country in sub-Saharan Africa to make sure that they are addressed, to make sure that their blood is always available to treat those medical emergencies and surgical emergencies that may need blood. So I'm going to talk about the Ugandan context. Dr. Ziki has shown you a graph of where we started off. Now I'm going to start from where he stopped, because he has shown us the history. So I'm going to continue with what is at the present and maybe look at what will be for the future. The demand for blood in Uganda is quite high. I think if there are clinicians here, Dr. Dung will allude to this with a test. Every time they are calling the blood bank, we need blood, we need blood for cancer patients, we need blood for children, we need blood for Dr. Grace's study. We need, blood. we need blood for obstetric cases. But do we have enough blood? We have, the problem is that we have a high birth rate and a high incidence of malaria. You've seen the population growth. I think we are going to see a population explosion. And the, the problem is that it is Africa that is having the highest I think birth rate, maybe even Uganda. And when you look at, at Uganda, it is the, that low income class which is having so many children. You find a woman who has no job, has about 10 children. 
she can't even be able to feed them. These children are falling sick now and again. So this high birth rate and the high incidence of malaria really are a big challenge to the blood safety program in Uganda. So we are under pressure to keep pace. But you know, blood donation is a voluntary act, like I said. Much as we want to make sure that we achieve this sufficiency, but the response from the community might be poor because this blood does not come from trees. This blood comes from human beings. And if the human beings do not donate this blood, then very likely we shall still be under pressure to keep pace, to be under pressure to make sure that we try to solve this problem. So provision of self blood is a key component in the Uganda Ministry of Health's minimum health care pa package and in Millennium Development Goals 4, 5, and 6. I think that is HIV, maternal and child health, and, and children. So what do we do? The ministry has tried to put blood transfusion at its forefront, and we hope it will continue to do so. Most of our blood, like 45% of blood, treats children under five. And most of these children are with severe anemia, from malaria. You can see that child. She looks so, she, okay, she's well nourished, but at any one time, she can get a bout of malaria, and she can get anemic, end up in hospital, and may need blood. Mothers, 30% of our blood treats women before, during, and after childbirth. I think somebody in obstetrics is going to give a talk about transfusion in obstetric care. They take up most of our blood. You can imagine, all these cases are preventable. So if we had good antenatal care, if we had good postnatal care, if we had maybe good primary health care, cleared all the bushes of mosquitoes, and maybe good feeding, maybe blood would only be needed for these high level class, high level, Operations like cardiac, like cancer, because those need blood. But children, if you treat malaria, if you prevent malaria, then that 45% can go further to, to be enough to cater for other conditions. If you add the 45 and the 30, that is about 75%. If these, were, these two were prevented, then would you have enough blood to cater for all the other medical conditions that need blood. So, who are our partners? We, UBTS, we are a Ministry of Health Semi-Autonomous Organization, which is mandated to collect safe blood from voluntary non mutated donors for supply to all hospitals in Uganda free of charge. We give our blood free. So you can imagine, you must make sure we collect safe blood but to collect safe blood from a, a country with a, a prevalence rate of about 7.4% is a real nightmare and a big challenge to us. We also have partners, Uganda Red Cross Society. Their employees are responsible for mobilizing blood donors and for pre and post donation counseling. We do work with Red Cross and most times people tend to mistake us for Red Cross because Red Cross, you know, has that voluntarism act. So we, if we work with Red Cross, then we know maybe they could go to the grassroots and mobilize communities to donate blood so that they can help those in need. We also have the government of Uganda. We receive support from the government of Uganda through the Ministry of Health for our Blood Safety Program, for which we are grateful. The government of Uganda has continued to support us and has continued to increase funding to UBTS for our programs. Then we also have PEPFA. In my begin, uh, opening remarks, I said many sub-Saharan countries cannot maintain blood safety programs without donor funding. Just like Uganda, we have donor funding. We have received funding from PEPFA since 2004 for infrastructure development, for blood collection and testing, 
and technical assistance among other areas for which we are also very grateful. At the beginning from 1989, we had EU funding. So when the EU funding ended in 2004, we are just lucky that we had PEFWA that came on board. This funding is going to end next year. So we don't know what is going to happen, but we pray that maybe John Hopkins, maybe the Paget Donor Center can come on board to help us to maintain and to sustain this hard work we have started. We don't want to fall back. We want to continue to improve services because healthcare services are improving in Uganda. So we have to keep pace. That's why we have a big challenge. Then you have had the joint population program. We have had support from DFID via the joint population program and WHO in this financial year. We are trying to look elsewhere to get additional funding to be able to meet our hospital blood needs, but it's not a very easy venture. So how have we progressed? Dr. Ziki showed you where we stopped in 1989. So, but since then, we have grown from a service that was supplying blood within a radius of 100 kilometers from Kampala in 1989 to a network of seven regional blood banks in Arua, as you can see in the north there, in Fort Porto, in, in Igulu, in Kitovu, in Imbare, in Imbarara and Nakasero. You can see we, are, we have tried to set up regional blood banks in the whole of Uganda, except in the Moroto area, underserved. And these regional blood banks are supported by the six collection centers in Hoima, in Masaka, in Kabale, Rukungiri, Jinja, and Soroti. And these are supported also by 22 mobile blood collection teams that go out every day in the field to collect blood. So we hope we shall be able to set up a regional blood bank in the Moroto area if we get additional funding. So what have we done? How have we progressed since 2003? Since then, we have created an enabling environment for 100% voluntary non blood collection. Remember I said Voluntary blood donation is the safest. So we have worked hard to achieve this goal. So, and I'm happy to report that all our blood is collected 100% from voluntary blood donors because we know they are relatively safer than replacement and relatively safer than paid donors. Blood collection has almost doubled since 2003. As you can see, we collect close to 200,000 as compared to what Dr. Ziki had shown you in 1989 when we were collecting 100, about 100,000. We have also increased the capacity to issue blood to all the, health, all the hospitals in Uganda that do transfuse blood. And you know that it's only from healthcare, health center four, whereby blood transfusion is allowed in this country. So what were our strategies to meet our national demand? We worked hard since the beginning of, the, of, the, of this other program. We advocated for 100% voluntary blood donation because we know these are the safest donors. And we know that if we have 100% voluntary blood donation, then we know that we, it is going to be more cost effective to collect blood, to test blood. And then we know that it's going to be safe and we shall be at least maybe 99.9% .9 sure that this blood we collect is safe because we are collecting it from regular blood donors. We have established a national voluntary blood donor program vis-a-vis -vis those other countries in sub-Saharan Africa which don't have a voluntary blood donor program, which have a hospital-based blood program. There are even then those countries that still have replacement blood donation. We have incorporated a 100% voluntary blood donation in our national policy. We have guidelines that guide us in the 
management of our activities. And we have also secured sustainable funding from the government, donors, and partners. You have seen the government is supporting us. We have partners, we have CDC, we have WHO, we have the Uganda Red Cross Society, and we have the JPP. We have provided suitable infrastructure, facilities, and equipment. With this CDC funding, we are able to construct, to put up five regional blood banks, which are purpose-built, and we hope that we shall receive funding to put up additional two regional blood banks in Arua and Masaka. We have appointed and trained an adequate number of staff and volunteers to be able to carry out the blood safety activities. We have implemented quality systems. I think those people who will come to, to, to the blood bank on Friday will be able to go through our quality manuals and to see and make sure, how we make sure that blood is issued when we are 100% sure that it is safe for issuing. We have strengthened collaboration and partnerships like Uganda Red Cross Society, the Joint Population Program for increased blood collection. Because you know, we need to collect more because many people are falling sick and even medical facilities are improving health care. So we have to keep pace with the others. We have fostered a culture of voluntary blood donation in Uganda. Our voluntary blood donation, regular donation rate is about 62%. People come in at their own free will to donate blood. And many other corporate organizations have even helped us to mobilize. They mobilize their donors, their staff, or people, and invite us to collect blood. But we have been able to keep up with this. We have identified and targeted low-risk blood donor populations like schools, like colleges, like the community service program. That's why you find that during holidays, we get a problem. When the schools and colleges are on holiday, then there are times shortages in hospitals for blood because most of our donors are students from schools. The community response has been quite poor. So that's why we initiated this community resource program to be able to go to the grassroots and encourage the communities to be responsive and also contribute to this noble exercise. We have developed communication strategies for donor education and community involvement. We have built partnerships with the media. We hold radio, TV, TV and talk shows and SMS messaging to remind our precious donors to come and donate blood on a regular basis. Through Uganda Recall Society, we have mobilized community partnerships and created net networks, and that is the Community Resource Person Program. And we have also maximized the impact of World Blood Donor Day by recognizing our regular blood donors. We always hold our World Blood Donor Day on 14th June to thank those donors and recognize those donors who have continued to support the blood safety program. But we still have shortages. Despite all these efforts, we cannot meet 100% our hospital blood demands. You see that we collect about 220,000 in a year, but this falls 10% short of hospital demand and 30% short of the WHO target of 1%. WHO recommends that blood donation should be at least 1% of the total population. So if we are 34 million, that means we are supposed to collect about 340,000 units of blood. But you see, we can only collect 220,000. So we still have a shortage. And we have reached 1.5 million people through blood donor mobilization efforts. But still, these are not enough to meet the shortfall. And 100% of blood is collected from the 170,000 unique voluntary non blood donors who donate blood on a regular basis to be able and meet the hospital blood demands. And over 90% of this blood is collected from 17 to 25 year olds in schools, universities, clubs, and in villages and towns. So you can imagine what has happened to those people who are beyond 25 years. Why don't they also respond to come and donate blood and be able to meet the shortfall, especially during the school holidays? 
So, we undertook a study last year to mobilize new donors in northern Uganda. So, we, we, in 2014, we received funding from a maternal and child health program, which is the Joint Population Program. And the aim was to increase blood collection in northern Uganda by 30,000 units of blood per calendar year. So we thought we could create new blood collection teams, and these new collection blood teams would increase blood collection at least by 20%. Because when you look at the map, the northern area seemed relatively underserved in terms of healthcare. So we thought maybe this joint population program, because it was working in the north, so we could work with it and work with the saving lives of mothers and children, because we know they take at least about 80% of all this blood collection. So if we could work with them, then we'd increase blood collection and save more mothers and children who would die in the northern Uganda due to lack of blood. So why focus on the north? Northern Uganda is behind the rest of the country in terms of health service provision. And only had two blood, two blood banks and four blood collection teams for population of about 8 million. And 10 out of the seven districts in the north, including all of Karamoja, we are unreached by the current blood collection team. So we thought we could make an impact by focusing on the north. And health and development indicators in the region were among the lowest in the country. So we thought we could do something to help those people. And hepatitis B zero prevalence rate and malaria was highest in the north. And 13.1 of of women and 34% of children were found to be anemic. So we thought we should do something to improve the health care of the people in the north. So what do we do? So we, we reached, we, how did we reach our targets? We created new teams. So we, collect, we, we created new collection teams which were hired and trained in Ilira. We recruited a second team in Arua and we set up a new blood collection and distribution center in Lira, and already now we have set up another one in Angar to be able to, to collect blood and to increase on the blood collection. We also devised new ways of working. We have built leadership and team motivation. We trained our teams and tried to motivate them by making sure that they collect more blood. We developed new messages, materials, and campaigns to make sure that we, we reach out to the population, to the communities in those areas. We improved timeliness and accuracy of data flow so that we know where are we when we set our targets. So we also devised new partnerships. There are those organizations in the north that are already working there, whom we partnered with, like New Heights and other implementing partners. We mobilized local leaders, institutional leaders, and others, and we engaged radio, TV, and other companies to help us mobilize donors in the North. You know, the North is sparsely uh, populated, so we had to, you, to find a way of how we could reach out to those communities to be able and understand messages for blood donation and come up with blood and increase blood services in the Northern region. So we started this product, project in January to June. We realized that we had an increase in blood collection by 2,000 more blood collected than in the same period of 2013. So if you look at the blood collections in Arua, Guru, and, and Lira, if you compare the three years, you find that 2014 has had an increase in the number of units that we have collected. That means our project is yielding fruits. Blood collection in West Nile was 18% higher than the previous, and the new leader team collected about 3,000 units of blood in just over four months through this partnership. And the new West Nile team has also started last month. We also devised new ways of working. We had a leadership training by experts from UK, the NHSBT, they are, we are working with them. We are having ongoing engagement with the teams to increase teamwork, communication, and motivation. You know, 
blood collection, if you don't work as a team, then there's no way you can collect, you can achieve the objective. Because on this team, you need a nurse, you need a phlebotomist, you need a counselor, you need a donor care attendant, you need a driver. So if these people don't work as a team, then there's no way they can be able to meet their targets on collect, of collecting blood. And you also need a blood donor recruiter on this team to go out and educate people on blood donation. We have had a new approach to community mobilization and engaging stakeholders. So we do look at the community resource program whereby we, 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 we get community leaders to help us to mobilize their, their people because they know the communities more. So they should more, more work with the communities to be able to collect blood. So we focus on partnerships with the local and regional organizations, the synergetic use of resources through joint activities. We had a communications workshop and we developed new materials for communicating to the communities. We increased timeliness and accuracy of reporting on blood collection so that we could see where are the shortfalls, where should we improve. So it is through this reporting that we made other strategies to be able to improve on the blood collection. So we partnered with the UK's NHS Blood Transplant Service. I hope maybe we can partner with the, our friends here to be able to increase blood collection. We had leadership training to build the capacity of team leaders to guide, support, motivate, and hold accountable their teams so that they are encouraged to work harder to collect blood. We focused on increased engagement and motivation of teams with impressive results. We have trained and involved people in project planning and decision making. We have improved on mentoring and support from team leaders. We have also improved on our feedback and analysis of blood collection data, which will help us to make improvements where there are shortfalls. We are developing a cloud-based blood donor database, which will enable teams to enter data so we, we, we have tried to improve efficiency on the data collection process, enhanced the quality and timeliness of data, and standardized the blood collection process to help us increase blood collection in the north. So we also had integration in the northern region. We had an opportunity. We had joint activities with the USAID-funded New Heights and created integrated health messaging and sharing resources and skills. We had six joint activities from May to June for community donor mobilization by blood teams where New Heights conducted safe male circumcision. So we are working with the other people to be able to reduce on the cost of mobilization of blood donors in the communities. We improved mobilization through working with the local leaders across northern Uganda. And we had the stakeholders meeting in Kampala, Aru, and Guru to create a strong network of, of local partners and support. People have come up to support. Like in Kirandongo district, we had the district police commander who partnered with UBTS to mobilize the community to, don to donate blood as part of a road safety program. We also improved mobilization of community leaders, local chairmen, parish chiefs, and VHTs. We are being used for donor mobilization across the region. And blood teams, we are forging closer links with institutional heads to better mobilize youth donors to send to achieve sustainability of our programs. So we use the local media, we use the local radio stations in Guru, which offered free airtime, or made concessions for creating awareness about blood donation. The district chairman and mayor of Guru both offered to discuss blood donation during their radio spots, or to invite the donor recruiters to join them for question and answer sessions. And in Ajumani district, the local leaders they supported the donor mobilization through local radio broadcasts and reversing the poor turnout. Because before, in the previous years, the turnout was very poor in the northern region. And we realized that radio mobilization was vital for accessing communities which had high levels of illiteracy. So that's how we could only reach them through the radio. Now, what is the impact so far? Capacity building has enhanced performance of our field teams. We have increased motivation and engagement of the teams and set to meet the ambitious targets ahead. 
blood collection has increased by that about 75 percent that's saving 75 percent lives of mothers and children and even technical skills have increased Lira blood collection and blood distribution center has brought services near to the health units in Lango sub-region and Abim because before the blood the regional blood banks were quite far from most of these hospitals so there has been increased accessibility to safe blood transfusion in the area, leading to reduction in child and maternal mortality in the region. And all demands for blood from all health units supplied by Guru Blood Bank, we are met 100% in March and April. So looking forward to the future, what, do we, how, what is the future for you, BTS? And what are the next steps? You know, as UBTS, we have to look to the future. So what do we intend to do? We realize that mothers and children take a bigger percentage of our blood. So we are planning to engage projects that involve mothers and children, and we hope to engage the maternal and child health programs. Also, we also hope to engage malaria programs to help us in mobilizing blood donors and to help us in collecting more blood for our blood safety program. Thank you very much.